Let's take a look at the remaining problems here uh, on our practice test three, starting with number nine. Uh, keep in mind that uh, number nine through 11 are all method of partial fractions. So in some of them, while there may be other uh, alternative methods to solve them, I need to see the method of partial fractions on all three of these problems. So that's our, uh, what we learned in section seven, five out of the book. Uh, and whenever we're thinking about partial fractions, the first thing that we know is that we have to have a factored denominator. So in this first one, uh, you just have to factor that denominator first thing. So we say, well, it has to be factors of negative 14 that sum to be five. And so we can say, well, we know that's seven and negative two. So I algebraically decompose the fraction five X minus eight over X plus seven X minus two here. And then we can say, well, that's equal to a over x plus seven plus b over x minus two. Now, whenever we're solving for a and b, you just multiply through by the least common denominator of x plus seven x minus two on both sides. And then when you do that, you can see that your left-hand side is five x minus eight. Your right-hand side is gonna have a times x minus two and b times x plus seven. Uh, so now I know I can solve for a by letting x equal negative 7. When I do that on the left-hand side, 5 times negative 7 is negative 35, minus 8 is negative 43. On the right-hand side, you'll have negative 7 minus 2 is negative 9. So negative 9 times a is negative 43. That gives me a is equal to positive 43 over 9. Now, in order to solve for B, you would just let X equal two. And when I let X equal two on the left, you can see your left-hand side, um, five times two minus eight, that's just equal to two since it's 10 minus eight. On the right, you're gonna have two plus seven times B, nine B equals two, thus B is equal to two ninths. Now, when you have A and B solved for, we know that the original problem is just going to become the integral of these two separate integrals, a over x plus seven and b over x minus two, it's better if you factor out the a and the b coefficients in front of each uh, integral. So I get 49 times the integral of dx over x plus seven plus two ninths times the integral of dx over x minus two. Every single solitary time, if the derivative of the denominator is in the numerator, then the answer is the natural log of the absolute value of that denominator. And we can see in both of these here uh, that that is the case. So we just get 43 over nine, natural log of the absolute value of X plus seven, plus two ninths, the natural log of the absolute value of X minus two, plus that constant of integration. Now, number nine is intended to be the easy uh, partial fractions decomposition problem. That's a case one problem where your denominator just had uh, linear factors and none of them were raised to a power. Number 10 is a case two type of problem. Now notice I went ahead and uh, factored your denominator for you, but you can see that the first linear factor in that denominator is raised to a power. So we have to remember the technique that, that we use whenever we decompose that fraction is that you're going to need a separate fraction for every power of that linear factor X minus four. So you're gonna have one fraction with an X minus four to the first in the denominator, another one with an X minus four squared in the denominator. Had that been X minus four cubed, I would have had a third one with X minus four to the third. Uh, and then of course I have a separate fraction for the X minus one. As soon as you look at that denominator and say, well, it would be degree three if I multiplied out all the X's, you knew that you would have uh, three letters, A, B, and C in that numerator, in which I do in this case. So every over every linear denominator, I have a constant coefficient in the numerator. So now once we decompose our fraction down into A over X minus four plus B over X minus four squared plus C over X minus one, I know I can solve for B and C easily. I can solve for B by letting X equal four, and I can solve for C by letting X equal one. And then it should be easy to go back in and solve for A. Before we do that, we multiply by the least common denominator on both sides. The least common denominator is always 
what's over here, the x minus 4 squared times x minus 1. When you multiply by that on the left, of course, you just have 5. On the right, you have a times 1 power of x minus 4 times the x minus 1, b times the x minus 1, and c is multiplied by both factors of the x minus 4. Now, if I allow x to equal 4, I see that the a and the c cancel out because they're multiplied by 0. Uh, you'll have on the left-hand side, if you let x equal 4, the left-hand side doesn't have an x, so it just stays 5. The right, you're going to have 4 minus 1 times b. 3b is equal to 5, thus b is equal to 5 thirds. Then we can say, okay, once we get the b value of 5 thirds, let's go and work on c. Uh, so I let x equal 1. Again, the left-hand side, just 5. The right, you can see that your a is going to cancel, your b is going to cancel. They're both multiplied by 0. c is going to be multiplied by the group 1 minus 4 squared, that's negative 3 squared, which is 9. I'll get 9c is equal to 5. So I can see that my answer is 5 over 9. Now I have my answer for A, sorry. I have my answer for B. I have my answer for C. I can find my answer for A by looking at the coefficients of the x squared terms. If you look on the left-hand side, you don't have an x squared term. Thus, automatically, you know the coefficient of x squared is zero. If you look on the right-hand side, b cannot equal a coefficient of x squared, but a is the coefficient of x squared, and c would be the coefficient of an x squared term. So I know that the coefficients of x squared are a plus c on the right, and I know that the coefficient of x squared is supposed to be zero. This allows me to see that a is just the negative of c, and thus, since c is 5 over 9, a is negative 5 over 9. Now I rewrite the original problem. The whole point of these partial fraction decomposition is to rewrite your original integral as the integral of the summation of these three easier integrals. So I can say, then the original problem is equal to negative five over nine times the integral dx over x minus four. That's just factoring the a out of that first group. And then again, I'll factor the b out and I would say plus five thirds and I'll get dx over x minus four squared. And again, I'll factor the c out plus five over nine times the integral of dx over x minus one. Now, the first and third integral, super easy, because every time we see the derivative of the denominator in the numerator, the answer is the natural log of the absolute value of that denominator. So these two are already done. You can see I went ahead and said negative 5 over 9, natural log of x minus 4, and plus 5 over 9, natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1. The one in the middle, not that easy, though. So here you're supposed to be looking at this and saying, well, that's the group x minus 4 to the negative 2 power. So when I integrated that, I just said, well, it's just the power rule on a group. x minus 4 to the negative 2 is going to become x minus 4 to the negative 1 power divided by that new exponent of negative 1. And I still had my coefficient of 5 thirds out front. So notice now, whenever I write that in my final answer, I can say, well, I have a positive times a negative. That means this second term is being subtracted. And I'll have a 5 in the numerator. And in the denominator, I'm going to have 3 times this group, x minus 4 to the first power. At that point, you have your final answer of negative 5 over 9, natural log of the absolute value of x minus 4, minus 5 over 3 times the group, x minus 4, plus 5 ninths natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1, plus your glorious constant of integration. Now, you're thinking, well, hey, that problem was kind of fun. Uh, we have a case 1 problem, a case 2 problem. Uh, what about a problem which is a combination of case 5 and case 3? I will not give you a case 4 problem uh, where you have an irreducible quadratic raised to a power. So those can become very long, uh, but fun, but just too long for one problem on a test. So 
this is at first a case five problem, and you're supposed to recognize that by just saying, well, anytime the degree of the numerator is not less than the denominator, you're going to need to divide the denominator into the numerator first. And then in number 11, you already know that the denominator that you have, it's an irreducible quadratic. So once you do your division, you're going to be left with a problem uh, that you'll need to go ahead and think about how to deal with it using our uh, partial fraction decomposition. Okay, so first step, I divide the denominator into the numerator. X squared goes into X cubed X times. Then I can say X times X squared is X cubed. X times one, I get X. Now, at that point, I can say, uh, I'm subtracting out all of these. And as long as you're canceling out the first term each time, you're doing what you're supposed to do. So the X cubed cancels here. I have X squared minus no term of X squared, still have an X squared left. Then I'd bring down minus X plus four. Now X squared goes into X squared one time. One times X squared is X squared. One times one, I get a one. We subtract out the X squared plus one. That cancels out the X squared terms. You'll bring down your negative X and be careful here, you'll have four minus one for a three. So I have negative X plus three is left over. So I can say then this original problem, which was equal to this, uh, is going to equal the integral of the part that divided evenly, the X plus one with respect to X. And then I can say, all right, this would be plus the integral of negative X plus three over X squared plus one. Now, the, the numerator is already set up, so I don't have to do any AX plus B. I already know what A and B are, the negative one and the three. So there's no need to do uh, anything else. I just go ahead and set up the two other integrals, but I need to remember that it's gonna work out better if I create two separate integrals for, these, for this remaining portion. Uh, so I know that I can call this minus X over X squared plus one with respect to X, and then plus the integral of three over X squared plus one. I'm gonna bring that three out front and we already know that the integral of one over X squared plus one, that's by definition, the inverse tangent of X. So that last function is just gonna be three inverse tangent of X. The one preceding it here, we're supposed to remember that anytime the degree of the numerator and denominator differ by one, it's going to be a natural log. And then I can say, well, but if it were just the natural log of X squared plus one, you would need to see a two X in that numerator. I don't see a two. So I, if I multiplied by two on the inside, I'd need to multiply by one half on the outside. And you can see that's where this came from here. The integral of X plus one gave me one half X squared plus X. And then I said this next one, if I multiply by two, then the derivative of the denominator is in the numerator. So if I multiply by two on the inside, I multiply on the outside by one half. That's where this minus one half, the natural log of X squared plus one came from. I really didn't need that absolute value there, but it's okay if you put it. Uh, and then I'll have plus three inverse tangent of X plus the constant of integration. Beautiful problem. Uh, okay, up uh, next, or I should say, uh, in the next set of problems, we're moving on into where we have to determine the best uh, integration technique. So these could be substitution, they could be integration by parts, uh, they uh, could be just trigonometric derivatives, they could be trig substitution, they could be partial fractions, you have to think about them. Uh, so when I'm thinking about number 12 here, it gives me the integral of the square root of one plus X over one minus X. So what I did in this case is I, I, I didn't like the way that this square root was set up. So I'm simplifying out. I'm multiplying by an understood one in the very beginning of the problem. So multiplying by that, by that understood one uh, allows me to say, well, anytime I have the square root times itself, 
I'll, I'll just get the one plus X without a square root in the numerator. That's going to be helpful. Now in the denominator, uh, anytime you multiply a term by its conjugate, you'll just get the first term squared and then minus the last term squared. So I get the square root of one minus X squared all under, well, I, I've already said the square root of that. So the square root of one minus X squared DX there. Now I, I know that if I just say one over the square root of one minus X squared, that's by definition, the inverse sine of X. So that that's cool. And I'll go ahead and separate the numerator into one over the square root of one minus X squared. And then that doesn't even need a technique. That's just your inverse sine of X. Your other one, you'll have X over the square root of one minus X squared. And at that point, a simple substitution can work out. You can say, if I let U equal what's inside of that square root, then DU would be negative two X DX. I know I can get a negative 2x dx up there. I would just need to multiply the numerator by a negative 2, which means I need to divide by a negative 2 on the outside, or as I would prefer to say, multiply by a negative 1 half on the outside. That's where this minus 1 half came from here. Minus 1 half, and then I would just be left with 1 over the square root of u du, which gives me u to the negative 1 half power inside of that integral. Then once you use your integral power rule, this is going to become u to the one half power divided by one half. It's going to cancel this one half out in front. You can see one half times two is going to cancel in the next step. So I would have inverse sine of x minus u to the one half plus c. And then you just say, well, u to the one half, that's just the square root of u, which is the square root of one minus x squared. Final answer, inverse sine of x minus the square root of one minus X squared plus the constant of integration. So for this problem, we see that the technique that was needed was just a uh, algebraic simplification to get rid of the square root in the numerator. And then once I did that, it was separating it up. The first one was inverse sine of X and the second one just needed a, uh, a simple substitution to simplify it out. Now for the next problem, you automatically know anytime you see your trig terms in there, you say, oh, this is section 7.2 where I'm trying to use my techniques of trig integrals. What are you supposed to remember in this? Anytime you have sines and cosines in there, you want to attack the odd power of sine, cosine, tangent, and cotangent. So clearly, the one that I'm working with in this problem is the sine function. That's what I do right here. I say, let's go ahead and work with that sine to the fifth of x. When we attack it, we say we need to rewrite all but one power of the sine function in terms of cosine. We know one minus cosine squared is sine squared. So one minus cosine squared quantity squared would equal sine to the fourth. So here I have sine to the fourth times sine to equal sine to the fifth. This first part in terms of cosine, I need to go ahead and square out and say, well, it's just the trinomial expression, one minus two cosine squared X plus cosine to the fourth X. And then I still have my factor of sine X on the outside. Now I go back into the problem. Then I can say, then this problem, which was the integral of the sine to the fifth times the cosine to the fourth DX, is equal to the integral of this expression of cosine, which is equal to sine to the fourth power times the existing cosine to the fourth I already had in there times that remaining factor of sine x dx. Now, this is guaranteed to be set up very nicely now to where a simple substitution will work. You'll let u equal the cosine of x, and we know that du is the derivative of cosine negative sine of x dx. I have a sine of x dx in there. I would need to multiply the inside by a negative and multiply the outside by a negative. That's where this negative sign came from right there. And then the negative sine of x dx all became du on the inside. At the same point, I went ahead and distributed this cosine to the fourth through here. And I said, well, when I do that, I'm going to have u to the fourth minus 2u to the sixth 
uh, plus u to the eighth. Now we can easily uh, do the uh, integration power rule on that and just say, well, we're going to get u to the fifth over five minus two u to the seventh over seven plus u to the ninth over nine. Of course, this group is still all multiplied by the negative out front plus our constant of integration. Final answer here, when you substitute back in the cosine of x for u, uh, and I, I distributed the negative on the outside too, as you can see, we should get negative one fifth, the cosine of the fifth power of x, uh, and then plus two sevenths, the cosine of x to the seventh, minus one ninth, the cosine of x to the ninth, plus your glorious constant of integration there. Uh, for the last of these questions where you're supposed to try any technique, uh, this one, it should automatically be a pretty much uh, a, an, an easy choice in your first step. You have the integral of x to the fourth natural log of x dx. So as soon as you see the natural log in there, you're supposed to be thinking, well, when I have integration by parts, I let u equal liate, the very first letter of liate, L, stands for logarithmic functions. We should instantly try, or at least think about integration by parts when we see a natural log in there. So I can say, all right, I'll let u equal the natural log of x. That means dv has to be everything else in there, the x to the fourth dx. Then I can say, all right, let's take the derivative of u. Derivative of the natural log of x is one over x dx. The integral of x to the fourth is x to the fifth over five. So I can say, then the original problem is equal to integration by parts formula, u times v. It's better if you put the algebraic term first. So I'll say one fifth x to the fifth natural log of x minus the integral of v du. So when I said minus that integral of v du, I knew I could factor out a one fifth that came out. And then on the inside of the integral, you have one over x times x to the fifth, that's x to the fourth integrated with respect to x. What we're left with is an extremely easy integral that we can integrate, that's gonna be x to the fifth over five. So our final answer here is just gonna be one fifth x to the fifth natural log of x minus one fifth times x to the fifth over five, that's where I get the minus one twenty fifth x to the fifth plus your constant of integration. Pretty straightforward problem. Now, these last three problems should not bring in any challenge as far as the integration techniques needed within them, but I will be looking to make sure you use proper form in your integration. So you cannot leave an improper integral. An improper integral either has an, an infinite limit of integration or a limit of integration where the function is undefined at. You cannot leave that in your problem and expect to get credit. So I'll say, okay, uh, when I look at 15 here, I instantly recognize, well, it's an improper integral because I have negative infinity as my lower limit of integration. That's not allowed in a proper integral. So I can say, okay, I'll have to get rid of that. Uh, and then I'm thinking, on the, as far as the integration goes, it's going to be pretty easy because I just have a linear function raised to the negative one power. Uh, so uh, that's, and, and you can also think of it as uh, the derivative of the denominator would be negative four. So all I would have to do is multiply the numerator by negative four and uh, multiply the outside uh, by negative one fourth, and you'll be able to say it's negative one fourth the natural log of the absolute value of the denominator. But let's talk about that in a second. First things first, make it a proper integral. Anytime the lower limit of integration is negative infinity, you need to replace it with an A and say we're taking the limit as A approaches negative infinity. And the reason I choose an A for the lower integral, remember our definite integral is defined as the integral from A to B. It represents the area from A up to B on that integral. So anytime you're replacing the lower limit, you replace it with an A and you just say, well, A is going off towards negative infinity. 
And then I can say the integral from A to zero. Now, when I'm evaluating this, I, I chose to just think of that as three minus four X to the negative one power. And then I, go, I use the power rule when I integrate it. Please remember though, you have to leave that limit as A approaches negative infinity until you physically plug A in for X. So I'll say, all right, the limit as A approaches negative infinity of this function integrated is going to become, uh, we know that negative one is the exception to the power rule. So you said, well, anytime you have a group to the negative one power, it's gonna be the natural log of the absolute value of that group. And then you just say divide by the derivative of what's inside of that group. That's where I get negative one fourth natural log of three minus four X. And it has to be inside of an absolute value. We're evaluating this from A to zero. So I can say, well, oh, all right. When I first evaluate, I evaluate at the upper limit. The upper limit uh, doesn't need this limit as A approaches negative infinity. You're just plugging in a zero. I would get negative one fourth, the natural log of three for the upper limit. Now the lower limit, you would say minus, but what we're subtracting is negative. So I went ahead and said plus the limit as A approaches negative infinity of this relation with an A plugged in for X. So I said plus the limit as A approaches negative infinity of one fourth natural log of the absolute value three minus four A. Then I can say, all right, here's where I have to think about it. If you're letting A go to negative infinity, the negative four times negative infinity, that's going to infinity. So the inside of your natural log is going to infinity. If you're thinking about what the graph of the natural log, please remember every natural log function crosses through the point one zero and then it rises very slowly thereafter. But the limiting value as X goes to infinity is infinity. So I'd say, well, all right, then this is one fourth times infinity. One fourth times infinity, still infinity. Infinity plus any finite number, infinity. So I can say my answer here is an infinite answer. Uh, and that's what I would want to see for the absolute final answer there. Uh, for number 16, this one is one in which we have uh, a limit of integration that causes our function to not exist. Notice, Anytime you have a rational function that you're trying to integrate uh, with a, and in fact, this is a radical in that denominator, uh, but I can say, well, that denominator cannot equal zero and it would equal zero if X were equal to five. Yeah, uh, that would give you a one over zero, which is undefined. So I can say, well, is it okay for your integral to be undefined at one of its limits of integration? Actually, it is as far as our answer is involved, but just to make sure we use the correct notation and say, well, we, we don't really care what happens at the right-hand limit. We only care about the area between zero and five. We show that by saying, we're going to take the limit as B approaches five from the left. And anytime you replace the upper limit, since all these integrals are the integral from A to B, we replace the upper limit with B. You would, now we don't have to replace the lower limit. If we did, we would replace it with A, just like we did in the last problem. But in this one, I can say it's the limit as B approaches five. Now, I need to make sure you understand why I put this from the left. I cannot, I would count off if you just said the limit as B approaches five, because the limit as B approaches five automatically means you could be approaching five from the left or from the right. We are not approaching five from numbers above five. We're approaching five from numbers below five, which the left-hand limit signifies. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to worry about that anytime your limits are infinite. It is absolutely impossible to approach negative infinity from the left. So by default, you're always approaching negative infinity from the right, which means you don't have to put that there. So anytime the limits are infinite, please don't put left or right. They're, they're automatically guaranteed to be a one-sided limit. We have to put the one-sided limit on any finite number here. So I'm approaching B 
uh, or sorry, the limit is approaching five from the left. So the limit as B approaches five from the left of the integral zero to B. You can see here, just as in the last problem, I went ahead and rewrote that linear function five minus X raised to the negative one third power. And then I can say, well, I, I can do the power rule. Uh, the power rule, if, you, if the inside function is a linear, you just say, take that group to the one greater power. So the group five minus X raised to the two thirds power. Then you would divide by that new exponent, which is dividing by two thirds, same thing as multiplying by three over two. And you divide by the derivative of what's inside of that function, you divide by negative one. Now, of course, you could have done yet another U substitution here, but it's going to lead you to this exact same answer. So it's better if you just think of it as the reverse chain rule here. So you say increase the power by one, divide by that new power, and divide by the derivative of what's inside the group. That's where the negative three over two multiplying this group came from. So at this point, I need to see the limit as B approaches five from the left of the group, negative three over two times five minus X all raised to the three, two over three power evaluated from zero to B. When we evaluate at the upper limit B, that's just no, that is just a number approaching five. I'll say, all right, the limit as B approaches five from the left of this expression, negative three over two times five minus B to the two thirds, that needs to be subtracted from, but I went ahead and put plus because Subtracting a negative is adding a positive, three over two times this group evaluated at zero, which ends up just giving me three over two times five to the two thirds power. Now, at this point, evaluation is easy. In this first group, you would just say, well, I can literally plug a five in for B here. When I do, I see that that's just going to be five minus five, which is zero. The whole first term is zero. So the only answer we're going to get is out of the second term, which is gonna be three over two times five to the two thirds power. I would be okay if you left it like that. I went ahead and cleaned up the answer though. And I just said, well, that's nothing more than the cube root of five squared. Cube root of five squared is the cube root of 25. So I wrote my final answer as three on that cube root of 25 all over two. Nice final answer there. Uh, now for the last problem here, Number 17, we have the integral from 6 over pi up to 1 of 1 over x on the square root of x squared minus 1. So before we even talk about the limits, I'm wanting you to see on the inside, oh, this is just your inverse secant of x. Now, what's missing here in the inverse secant function, you have an absolute value around that x out front, but that is completely unnecessary here since all of your limits of integration are positive. So we can say, oh, okay, then yeah, this is just going to integrate to be the inverse secant of x since that absolute value would be unnecessary in this case. Uh, we know that this is going to be easy to integrate uh, as 15, 16, and 17 should all be easy to integrate. So what I'm looking for in 17 to make sure you get full credit for is the correct notation in this problem. And you say, all right, I'm going to have to introduce a limit. The limit that I'm going to have to introduce has nothing to do with the lower limit. Six over pi is fine, but that one is problematic because I can see that this function would not exist at one. If I tried to plug a one into this, my denominator would have a factor of zero, which would make the fraction on the inside of the integral not exist. So I can say, well, all right, again, it's an upper limit. So I'll say this is the limit as B approaches one from the left of the integral from six over pi up to B of dx over x times the square root of x squared minus one. We already know the inside integrates to be the inverse secant of x. So we can say this is the limit as B approaches one from the left of this inverse secant of x evaluated from six over pi up to B. When I evaluate the upper limit, I need that limit as B approaches one from the left of the inverse secant of B, and then minus the lower limit, which would be the inverse secant of six over pi. So now when I'm thinking of this first one, 
I can say, well, all right, it's the inverse secant of a number approaching one. So I can say, well, it's the inverse secant of one. And I can say, uh, that's the same thing as asking you, what is the inverse cosine of one? And you say, well, that's saying, when is the cosine function one? The cosine function is one at an angle of zero. And then the second one, uh, minus the inverse secant of six over pi, I would have been fine if you just left it like that. I went ahead and changed it to an inverse cosine and said, that's the same thing as the inverse cosine of pi over six. Now, be careful here. Uh, I, I could see somebody making a mistake and saying, hey, is the inverse cosine of pi over six, can I call that the square root of three over two? No, the cosine of pi over six is the square root of three over two. The inverse cosine of pi over six, I don't know what that is. It's asking you at what angle would that ratio be pi over six? Not sure. So I have to leave my final answer here as either the negative inverse secant of six over pi or the negative inverse cosine of pi over six, one way or the other there. I would want you to know that that first answer was zero because it was just asking you uh, the inverse secant of zero, same thing as the inverse, sorry, the inverse secant of one, same thing as the inverse cosine of one, which is both zero. Uh, so final answer, either negative inverse secant of six over pi or negative inverse cosine of pi over six. All right, guys, that'll do it for this practice test. Let me know if you have any questions.